Hey everybody, welcome to On The Minute. I'm Arm & Hammer, that right there. That guy is Justin LaFranco with Morning Chalk Up, and today we are gonna be covering a whole bunch of topics, and you are going to learn a whole lot about just what it is that's going on in the world of CrossFit. Isn't that right, Justin? Absolutely. Yeah, we got a fun, pretty fun lineup for us today. Fantastic, let's get to it. First up today, Haley Adams has recently joined a super team that didn't really need a lot more stars, and that is the Mayhem Independence team. Justin, Mayhem Independence is their second string, but when you're talking about their team, second string is like fourth at the game. So uh, yeah. what does this mean? Well, basically, uh, you know, after after the announcement came about the changes of the season, you're wondering, okay, is Mayhem actually going to field two teams or some of those individuals going to stick around? Lindy Barber went up to Boston and now uh, sort of left a little bit of a gap there. And so it was wondering, hey, are they going to fill uh, actually fill two teams? I know they're not sending two to Dubai. As far as we know, they're not sending two to Wadapalooza. But Rich Froning has always been looking to the younger generation to create a new crop of elite athletes. He did that with Nick Palladino. He's done that with uh, most, more specifically with Angela DiCicco. And now with Haley Adams coming uh, of age and turning 18 this season, she's now going to be in a perfect opportunity to learn from one of the best and you know extend the mayhem lifeline i think a little bit further now on top of that she is no slouch i mean she won the games in the girls 16 yep. 17 this past year she was second the year before that and then she was second in the girls 14 15 not the year to mention that. qualifying for regionals as a 16 year old then again as a 17 year old and she was even in the top 10 Going into, I think it was uh, event five, she was in the top 10. And I remember hearing her say that it just really lit a fire under her when she was in the top 10. And she's thinking, oh my gosh, I'm five places away from qualifying as an individual athlete. I think she's got a really bright future ahead of her. She's obviously been working very hard for the last several years. Um, she's been the top of the team game. But the fact that she's qualified for regionals for two straight years in a very competitive Atlanta division, um, th this girl's got a really bright future ahead of her, especially if she's going to be around athletes like Ellie and, and, and Kristen and Tasia. Speaking of teams, Justin, we have, thanks to you and the Morning Chalk Up, a preliminary list of nine teams, yep. pro teams, that are going to Wadapalooza. And I think the best way to describe this is both very familiar with some of the names on there, but also kind of strange. I mean, yeah. there are some teams on here who I don't even know if these team members have ever had a conversation with one another. Uh, absolutely. Uh, the most surprising of them all is Plus Ultra, which is Nick Urenker, Travis Williams, Camille LeBlanc, Bazinet, and Terry Helga Daughter. Um, four individuals. I could see Nick and, and Travis having a good rapport, and, and uh, have, they've worked together in the past, and they've, they've competed together. Um, I think it's Terry and Camille. Uh, and that mix, which doesn't quite add up. And, um, <laughs> and everybody that I've spoken to about this this uh, roster is just kind of blown away by that. That sticks out as being the, I, I don't see how those individuals all came about. Do they even have each other's numbers? Yeah, that's a great question. I can't quite figure out what the like connecting line is between these four athletes. Uh, Camille does her own programming, but works with CJ with Invictus. Travis Williams is a misfit athlete. Uh, Nikki Rankard does his own thing uh, with the Zeus method. Turi Helgadotter is uh, it's incredibly fit, but kind of an unknown. And somehow they just kind of all matched up on whatever strange like Tinder style app is being used for the CrossFit Games athletes right now. So it's, called it's called rosters. It's called rosters. Now that that right there is a business opportunity for whoever wants to make. I think that the happen. real the real question is: Can these four individuals, who other than Travis, have really been? individual athletes and Travis only more recently has become a team athlete can they actually come together and produce um, a team can be, can they be competitive in the team environment against these seasoned teams who have worked together literally some of them for years yeah absolutely not no chance okay no there's, chance there's a zero percent chance that a team of four individual athletes that doesn't train together is going to come together and beat a team like you know, Rich Froning's mayhem. In other news regarding Wadapalooza, we just recently learned that they have a relationship with Fittest in Cape Town. And this is the first relationship of this kind. It's kind of something that's going to bring a lot of cohesion to the game season that hasn't really been there, you know, over the past couple months. And that is the second and third place at Wadapalooza are going to have berths at Fittest in Cape Town to compete if they want to accept those places. And 
I, honestly, Justin, I think this is huge. I think this is this is yeah. like kind of the start of what makes a real sports season, and I'm I'm pretty pumped to see exactly how it turns out. Definitely, I totally agree about that. This is this is a huge news. The implications of this are significant because what you have is you've got two independent competitions coming together and striking essentially an alliance. And what they're saying is that there's an earned exemption now from from having to go through another set of qualifiers. Now, the sticky situation here is there's only 10 days that separate the end of Wadapalooza and the beginning of Fittis in Cape Town, but it's a first step forward and you have to strike a partnership where you can. And so it's unique in that uh, there's still a few unanswered questions like what happens you know, if the number two and number three placed individuals from Wadapalooza are already going and competing and what happens under that scenario. But as a whole, this is super important. This is a this is a pathway forward for professionalizing the sport of CrossFit and ensuring that athletes aren't cannibalized by continuing to do qualifiers every literally every two weeks. And some of these are even overlapping on top of one another. So I, I, I grade this as absolutely a positive for the sport of, uh, of fitness. They want to figure out an efficient system that allows the best athletes to show up at these events because those athletes bring crowds. Let's not. Put that aside because it's not just about um, um, filling out an event with 200 competitors. If when Matt Frazier goes to Dubai and he qualifies and he gets his $50,000 at Dubai, he's going to disappear from the sport for the next nine months and none of the fans are going to have an opportunity to see him. That's not good for the sport of fitness. We want to see Matt Frazier out there competing. We want to see other Matt Frazier's out there competing. And this is going to help ensure that they do that because if they can go collect a fifteen or twenty thousand dollar check for three days of competition, I guarantee you they will show up to be there, especially if there's some kind of earn exemption that's uniform across the board. Yeah, for sure. And you know, speaking of big checks being a big motivator for all these top athletes, we've seen a handful of events announce themselves as you know, marquee elite only one was the rogue invitational that came out recently. And, you know, this past weekend, we actually heard about the West coast classic, which is, uh, it's a first for a bunch of different reasons. One is the first one on the West coast on North America. It's going to be at Del Mar at the fairgrounds. And two, it is going to be run by the same people that run Wadapalooza. And so we're starting to see this, this web, this network start come together inside of these sanctioned events that's actually going to be really positive in the long run. My question to you, Justin, is do you see other event organizers starting to pull in their strings to create more than just the one or two events underneath yeah, their umbrella? Yeah, that's a great question. I think that that's a huge opportunity for some of these major players. Wadapalooza is one of the longest running competitions out there outside of the CrossFit Games. Granite Games is another one that you look at and you say there's a huge opportunity there, especially if they start pulling together and creating a coalition. And I think that I think that, that idea is, is um, brewing inside of the community of directors and individuals and stakeholders that have um, the ability to make these kind of decisions. I think this year is going to be a bit of a test run. Loud and Live is the perfect organization to create two events because they have the resources and they have the reach in order to pull that off. Another big point here is we were originally told 16 is going to be our number of sanctioned events. We're already past 16 when we're looking at the 2020 season. My guess is that in the next two or three years, we're going to have dozens of these events, you know, 25, 30, 35 events, even more, because there's going to be, uh, there's going to be more interest in having these competitive events. And with the games having this great culling in the first few days and just removing a bunch of athletes, it almost doesn't matter how many people qualify for the CrossFit games to start off. There could be some really clear indicators once we get outside of this season about how, how high that can grow. But there's clearly an appetite for for um, sanctioned events overseas. And so we've always said this. I think I think you, you've said this multiple times. When you go to Pacific uh, for the regional, when you go to the Meridian for the regional back at the Con Magica two years ago, it was like going to the CrossFit games in their area. So these foreign competitions are usually packed out because those fans aren't traveling all the way to California and then Madison to go watch the CrossFit Games. They were treating this like their CrossFit Games and they brought a lot of energy and a lot of sponsors and they filled out a lot of seats. If they can continue to do that, I could see the international market growing. So speaking of international growth, Justin, you guys recently put out an affiliate report looking at the rate of growth 
in uh, markets that aren't the U.S. The U.S. has historically been the fastest growing part of CrossFit's affiliate model and is still the single largest country, but it is no longer the majority of affiliates. Now, I think for the first time last year, we saw that the number of international affiliates was greater than the number of affiliates in the States. Right. But you have some interesting data about where that growth is actually happening. Yeah, and you know none none of this should come as a surprise. When Greg Glassman came and he you know he he broke the news about how this format is going to change and he wanted to globalize CrossFit even more, not just in the games perspective, but as the at the affiliate level perspective, a lot of these numbers will come and make sense. So what we did is we basically looked at the entire map of CrossFit and we said where where's Cross where are CrossFit affiliates growing the fastest, and then where are there the most CrossFit affiliates outside of the United States? As you pointed out. This year in the summer, it was before the CrossFit Games, um, CrossFit finally reached a threshold where there were more affiliates outside the United States than inside the United States. Today, it looks like roughly 48.3% of all gyms are located inside the United States, and the number of them growing overseas is far outpacing the United States, which makes sense considering there are about 7,400, 7,500 gyms inside the United States. They have... Um, saturated in the market it doesn't mean there's an opportunity for growth but growth is going to come a lot slower so what we found is this surprised me i couldn't believe it but brazil is the number two with roughly 1150 gyms and then from there the, the numbers are kind of interesting it's italy with number two uh, or excuse me number three australia four canada is five united kingdom is six seven is spain uh, france eight is spain nine is germany and ten are, is the netherlands and what's interesting is a lot of the sanctioned events that we've been talking about and following fall well within the top 10, which shouldn't come as much of a surprise to you. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it, it, listen, it's not a surprise to me that we're seeing a bunch of events show up in Europe uh, across that continent because there's so many CrossFitters. And that's something we were talking about as a huge flaw in the regionals format because we were getting an entire continent only being represented by five people which is, you know, just dropping the ball on CrossFit's end. That has been, you know, at least the the framework for resolving that problem is here now. But outside of those those nations that you listed, there's one that sticks out to me that that absolutely deserves to have at least one event and doesn't have any events, and that's Canada. I, I don't understand what CrossFit has against Canada. I, I they think already this is have, where you and I are going to disagree, though. They have events that deserve to be sanctioned games qualifying events. Right. They have the best games athletes in the world there. I don't know what else you need in order to actually I, you have know, a qualifier. You know, I, I don't know. The, the one There's one event I do know, the Atlas Games. That one's shown up on my radar screen a bunch. I've never really been able to find much info on it online or even watch the stream. I think you may be more familiar with it than I do. That's one candidate, I think, for a sanctioned event. I, I don't I don't think they're being underrepresented here. Uh, that's my own personal opinion. I think that there are what's there West Coast Classic. If we're counting next year, West Coast Classic, we have Rogue Invitational, Granite Games, Wadapalooza, and Mid Atlantic uh, CrossFit Challenge. There's five events in North America. I think North America has been uh, more than taken care of. Not every country needs its own uh, uh, sanctioned event, but that's just me. Listen, not every country <laughs> needs its own sanctioned event, but if you're looking at the top seven of the biggest affiliate countries, it yes. is a glaring hole that yes. Canada is not represented there. It, with it, an, it, with it, a it is. Brazil has one. Italy has one. Australia has one. You can make a reasonable argument that Canada is represented by five North American competitions. United Kingdom has one. Okay, France has one. I don't think Canadians would appreciate Sp that. They would not appreciate that. But Spain doesn't have one. Germany doesn't have one. The Netherlands has one. And one can reasonably argue that the, the competition in the Netherlands cover, covers, uh, uh, you know, the, the Spain, uh, the Spanish, uh, German. Uh, regions and um, and then you've got Italy having one that represents you know you got Spain they can go there too and compete so I, I think that you know they're just kind of spreading around I don't think it's politics this is my personal opinion I don't think it's politics here I think I think CrossFit was come one come all and uh, whoever puts together a good plan uh, maybe the Canadians just didn't didn't care I, I, I don't know I don't know any of those competitors I feel like they're represented pretty well here it's just a plane flight away to go to Minnesota which is likely where Granite Games will be um, you know, it's, uh, 
I don't know. You know what? Based on based off of my social media, based off of all the videos that I put out and all the Instagram uh, the posts that I put out and all the comments that are coming up on that, I can tell you right now, no one is okay with Canada I, not having. I agree. Any I want. I want to be. Events. I want to be. I want to buck the trend here. I, I've read these comments. I've seen it on Reddit. It's like, when's Canada gonna get one? When's Canada gonna get one? And it's like, I don't know. Maybe you should ask the people operating Canadian events why they didn't get one. Because, like I said, I only know of one, and that's Atlas Games. If you can name a second one, that's fine. But, uh, you know, the Atlas Games is the only one I can think of. Maybe there's a throw down in Montreal or Quebec uh, area, uh, Toronto. I, I don't think there's one in Vancouver, but, you know. You know what, Canada? I've got your back. Justin doesn't have your back. <laughs> Armin has your back. your back. I okay? am, I am uh, you know... I don't know what I don't know what I am, but I think that they've got plenty of opportunities. They've got five, you know. Um. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. We'll see how it goes. <laughs> they, I have no doubt that those athletes are not going to have any issue qualifying for the games. No. I'm just wondering where is O Canada's representation with these sanctionals? That's it. That's all I'm saying. Very simple question. You guys can answer it however you see fit. Yeah. But I'm just saying. Yeah, we're we're on a, a we're unfair. on separate lines of this one. I think they're doing fine. I think they'll do fine. I think uh, I don't think the flight's very long. Well, thanks so much for watching, everybody. This has been On The Minute. I'm Armin Hammer. That is Justin LaFranco, and we'll see you next time. Happy Thanksgiving.